Hi guys, this is the fourth video in my series about the Espresso techniques that I use in Cinema 4D to control dynamic cars. And this video is kind of like a follow on to the last video where I showed you how to make this little yellow car that's got random steering and he's also programmed so that when he goes outside the circle he comes back in again. Now I'll be providing this scene file as a download on the Vimeo page so you can work along with me today if you want. Okay, now today I'll be showing you how to clone this car up so that all the clones automatically are assigned a different random seed. And I'll also be showing you some of the uh, collision detection techniques that I use when I have multiple random cars all moving around in, in my scene. Now I've got an example here to show you why those two things are important. I've got some uh, little computer mouses here. This is just a mouse body stuck on top of a dynamic vehicle. Now if I was just to make one random car and then uh, copy and paste so they've got multiple copies, if I just did that, this is what you get. All your little random cars are not as random as you think because they're all moving more or less in the, the, in the same fashion. They're all turning at the same time because they've all got the same random seed basically. But I've got this kind of software technique where it doesn't matter how many cars I've got, they are all automatically assigned a different random seed. So I'll just enable that in my control panel here. Right, now this is what it looks like when the, my automatic random seed is switched on. As you can see, the cars all move around in totally independent fashion. But as you can see, these cars, they do kind of, well, one thing they do is <laughs> try and cl climb on top of each other. But they do tend to get a bit bunched up, especially if you get two cars kind of going head to head. They do get a bit bunched up like these two here. Okay, so I've got some uh, collision software built into my Expresso. I'll just enable that so you can see what, what how it works. And what's basically going to happen with this particular scene, now I've got loads of different uh, collision strategies by the way, but in this particular scene, because I want these mouses to always go in one direction, like that is with the uh, the scroll wheel at the front of the travel, what I do is I say that when the, uh, the car it detects a collision on the front, in fact I'll just show you what I mean here, these cars have got like a, a front bumper, which is separate from the rest of the bumper. So when the cars detect a collision on the front bumper, they just kick into reverse for about half a second. And that's usually enough to get them out of a little jam that they're in, and then they can carry on just being random. But any collision for the rest of the uh, out, outside, the rest of this bumper on the outside, that doesn't really contribute to the uh, collision detection uh, software stuff. So I'll just uh, put my mouses back in view. Okay, now this is what it looks like with the collision turned on. And uh, as you can see, when these mouses have a, a forwards collision, they just kick into reverse for a, a short period of time. Now, uh, I've got this uh, the reverse time as a, as a slider on my uh, control panel. And this is one of the reasons why you should always get into the habit of building control panels into your system as you're building it up. Because once you've got, like, I can't know, 50 of these mouses all banging and crashing each, into each other, then you decide that you should have changed one of the parameters. It's a lot easier if you've just got a slider that controls the, gr the global parameters for all the mouses. Okay, so let's just have a quick look at some videos of, the, of this uh, technique that I'm going to be showing today. I'll just show you a couple of videos to um, whet your appetite, so to speak. Right, I've got a load of these uh, purple mouses here in the Grayscale Gorilla City. I'll just hit play. And as you can see, they've all got independent random movements. And uh, when they get into a little bit of a jam, they reverse out of it. And then carry on being little random mouses. <laughs> Okay, I've got another example here, which is quite similar, but uh, if I can find it, uh, where is it now? Here we go. Okay, I've got these uh, rather badly designed robots, <laughs> but I mean, they illustrate a point, okay. These robots work the same way as, as, as the mouses do, in that they detect a collision on the front edge of their base, and if they, ha if they encounter a collision, they, they kick into reverse. Now, it's very important for, if you've got square vehicles like this, it's very important to have some kind of collision strategy, because square vehicles in particular, they really do get jammed up. Whereas if the vehicles were, say, a bit more um, smooth in their outline, you could just about get away with not having any collision software, but uh, this is what my little uh, robots look like. <laughs> And I've also got some uh, 
another example here, more or less the same technology, it's got some little Daleks here from the Doctor Who TV show, and these guys, they just uh, move around randomly, and they've got a bit of collision detection built into them. Okay, that's the kind of thing we'll be doing today. Okay, well, before we get stuck into the Espresso math, I just want to have a quick recap about exactly what's going on with this random dynamic car. This is for the benefit of people who haven't seen my other videos. Okay, well, the car setup is pretty standard. I've just got a cube for a body. I've got uh, four cylinders for the wheels. I've got four wheel suspension units, because this is a four-wheel steer vehicle. And I've got four motors, because it's a four-wheel drive as well. Okay, let's have a look at the Espresso. Oh, by the way, I've got a control panel which controls the speed and the torque and some of the other parameters in my Espresso scenario. Right, let's look at the motors first. I've got uh, an iteration list for my motors. It just keeps the window a bit more tidy. So I've got a list of all my motors and I've got a specimen motor here so that anything I do to this motor applies to everything in the list. Basically, I can just control the speed and the torque of the motors from my control panel slider. OK, let's just expand this a bit and have a, a look at the uh, at the steering setup. OK, like I said, this is a four-wheel steer. So I've got, uh, first of all, I've got a little condition node here where I say if the frame is less than five, the wheels are on straight ahead. That just keeps the wheels lined up at the beginning of the animation so that you don't get any wobbles later on. So after we've passed frame five, the regular steering takes over. And I've got a clamp here of uh, plus and minus half a radian, which is about 30 degrees left and right for the wheels. And then I've got the front two wheels being driven from the steering, and I've got a minus one driving the rear two wheels, so the two rear wheels go in the opposite direction. And that gives you your four-wheel steering. Okay, now uh, to steer this this little uh, fella, I've got some uh, noise data here. I'll just see if I can expand this. OK, I've got a noise node, which is, uh, I've been controlling the parameters from my control panel. But basically this just gives me some random data. And again, I've clamped it to plus and minus half a radian. And this is basically what gives the, uh, the car its random steering. OK, so far so good. Now when the car goes outside of the circle, I've got to make him point towards the centre so he, he knows where the centre is so he can steer back in. So I've got a null inside of the uh, the car body, this pointing null which is pointing at the centre of the scene. And I've got a bit of maths here which uh, allows for the fact that uh, it's often pointing in a direction behind a vehicle. So this just uh, does the maths to take care of the fact that the uh, it, this could be pointing in any old angle. <laughs> okay, so basically this just gives me the angle that the car has to steer towards to get back to the centre. Okay, now the uh, the main part of this, the main thrust of this whole setup is this business here, where I've got a little test where I say, is the car outside of the circle? That is, is the distance of the car from the centre of the scene greater than the radius of the circle? If it is, I trigger this monoflop. The reason I'm using a monoflop is it just gives me a bit of bit of delay, so when the car comes back into the circle, it doesn't go back straight back to his random behaviour. It's a bit of a delay. Otherwise, the car will kind of oscillate on on the on this on the perimeter. So basically, this this little setup here it says, is the car outside the circle? If it is, use the steer to the centre values until it gets back inside the circle. So when it's in the circle, the random noise is is in charge. Outside of the circle, steer to the centre is in charge. In fact, I think I'll just put these into an X group to uh, give us a bit more room. So I'll convert to X group. I'll rename this um, um, outside circle test. OK, and I'll just um, make sure that my ports are named. And I've got a bool on there, which is uh, exactly what one bool means out of the 0 or 1, by the way. OK, that's uh, everything uh, nice and neat and tidy. Oh yeah, before we uh, before I go on to the uh, Espresso Mass, I just want to show you a couple of plugins that I'll be using quite a lot today. This one here is called Auto Rename, and basically the way it works is that um, you can select a bunch of stuff 
in your um, in your object manager and it will automatically rename them and give them uh, sequential numbers so for instance if I was to copy this car oops if I was to copy this car say um, another four times I could just highlight all of those and uh, click on my auto rename and I can rename them um, dynamic car and add leading zeros I always add leading zeros because I often have more than 10 cars in my uh, setup so I just click rename and as you can see it's renamed all my cars the reason I use this auto rename is I'll be using these uh, the digits on the end of the cars names to generate my uh, automatic random seeds later on but that's what the auto rename does and I'll show you where you get it from it's a really handy bit of gear it's free by the way so you just find your way to this site called microbion or you can just google auto rename and you'll find it and uh, you just download it and it's uh, it works up to, I've tested it up to version 16 for cinema and uh, it's, a, it's a very handy little tool okay now the other thing I'll be using quite a lot today I'll just uh, get rid of those copies the other thing I'll be using today is oh yeah this one here reset PSR now this is from the menu so I've got these this in in my uh, custom interface here I uh, recommend that you uh, put some of these stuff into your interface like I've done it it's very handy to if you use them all the time where was I PSR yeah it's 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 from here from the character stuff uh, here we are, Reset PSR. Now, I don't know much about joints and character rigging, but I know what this Reset PSR does, and it just resets the position, scale, and rotation of your object. So, for instance, if you've been uh, tinkering around with your car, and uh, you've moved it, it could have even been rotated in some fashion, and it's all over the show, and you need to put it back at world center, you just highlight your car, click Reset PSR, and it puts the uh, the car body that is not the actual wheels or anything it puts the car body bang at the wheel center so that you can can then start doing your adjustments knowing that everything's nicely lined up okay but like i said it puts it at the wheel center now the car the, the complete car is actually a little bit below the floor as you can see which brings me to this next plug in here this fellow here called drop to floor so that if for instance your car has somehow ended up right up here <laughs> for whatever reason you've been adjusting it and it's somehow off the floor you just highlight your car and click drop to floor and bang it drops it straight to the floor as you can see on the floor okay and you can get that fella from uh, it's free as well this one is a free one from Kuro Yume's development zone hope I pronounced that right or you could just Google it, just Google drop to floor. And you got he's got loads of plugins, this guy, but if you just scroll down, here we go. He's got a couple of drop to floor um, gizmos actually, but this is the one I use, drop to floor version 1.1. And just install it in your plugins folder in, uh, in, in your cinema install. And basically, those two plugins, I use them all the time. Okay, enough for this intro, let's get stuck into some mathematics. OK, well the first thing I want to do is to modify the Espresso for this random car so that when I make copies, each copy is going to have a different random seed. But first of all, I better just tuck this Espresso null into the uh, hierarchy of the car so that when I copy this car, each car is going to have its own Espresso. OK, now the basis for this calculation for this uh, different seed for each car is going to be the fact that these cars are going to be numbered, sort of like car 01, car 02, etc. And I'm going to be stripping off the last two uh, characters of the car's name to generate a unique seed for the car. But uh, at the moment, this car hasn't got any numbers after its name, so I'm just going to manually change this to uh, car.01. Because uh, when, when I've finished modding the Espresso, I'm going to be duplicating this car, and then I'm going to be renaming all the cars using my auto rename plugin. So they'll all be renamed sequentially. But for the moment, I'll just call this car body.01. OK, let's have a look at the Espresso. Right, well, the thing I want to be uh, modifying in this window is uh, is this fella here, the uh, the noise steer. So let's have a look inside of this X group. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this link here where the, uh, the noise seed is coming from the control panel. I'm going to break this link and I'm going to add a bit of maths in here based on the, uh, on the name of the car. So we need to drag the, uh, the car into the window. 
Okay, and what we're interested in is the actual name of this object. So uh, under basic properties, here we go, name. Now in computer speak, uh, this, the, the name of this object is known as a string. All string means, it just means a collection of characters like letters and numbers, etc. So what we've got to do here, we've got to uh, use some, uh, some string manipulation. And all that stuff is uh, is over here on the left hand side of the Expresso editor, under XPool, under System Presets. There's a subheading called String, and there's quite a few uh, bits of uh, string manipulation down here. But what we're interested in is the the rightmost two characters of this string. So we need this fella here called Right String, and all it, all this all this node does is it takes an input, and it strips off however many characters you need starting from the right hand side so it counts from the right and by default it comes in with a value of three see right down here at the bottom three I need to change that to two so that now we're just stripping off the last two digits of uh, of the name of of this uh, of this car okay now what I'm going to do now is uh, just add the number that's derived from the name of the car, I'm going to add that to the master noise seed value from the control panel, and that'll give us a different seed for every car. So I want a math add. Where are we? Here we go. Math add. I need to add the uh, the value from the control panel to the number derived from the uh, from the car's name, and uh, plug that into the uh, seed input for the noise for the steering. So let's just hang a result on it and make sure everything's working. Okay, well, the, this right string uh, calculation should give us a value of 1. And it does. Okay. Now, uh, the uh, the master control, I'm going to rename this to master in a minute because the, at the moment it's just called noise seed. This is going to be like the global master seed for all the cars. But at the moment it's set on 15. So, 15 plus 1 from the name of the car is going to give us 16 for this car. So this car is going to have a seed of 16 for the random steering and car 02 is going to have a seed of 17 etc. Okay so let's just uh, tidy this window up then we can duplicate the cars and see if this little bit of theory works. Alright then I'm going to um, make a copy of, of this car and slide him across and make another copy and slide him across and make a, a fourth car and put him just behind. Okay, now I'll highlight these uh, four vehicles, get my auto rename plugin. I think I'll call these guys Car Dynamic. I'm going to add a leading zero. The reason I'm adding a leading zero is that uh, because my maths is strip off the last two digits, I've done that because I will eventually probably have more than 10 cars. And that's why I use the right string of a value 2. And that's why I've got uh, leading zeros in this bit of the calculation. <laughs> OK, so I'll just rename my cars and we'll close that. So there's two chances here it'll work or it won't. So let's hit play and see if these cars all have different random steering. Yep, and they do. And uh, mind you, they are sort of crashing into each other a bit. We've still got to sort out the collisions. But as you can see at the moment, they all have different random steering. And if I change my uh, master... In fact, let's rename this noise seed to master seed. Noise seed. We'll change that to... Uh, master ok so I'll change this let's just see where they go first of all yep they go like that and I'll change this value of the master C and they should drive around a bit differently and they do fantastic ok that's the first part of this uh, little exercise done OK, well now that the cars have all got different seeds for their random steering, as long as you stick to this naming convention of having a two-digit number after the name of each car, you could in theory have up to 99 cars in this scene and they would all have different random steering. But then if you weren't quite happy with how the uh, animation was rolling, you just got to change the master value on this slider here and then all the cars would have a completely different set of seeds for their random steering. 
Okay, the only thing we've got to sort out now is this collision business. Okay, well this is the first thing we'll be building today and what's going on here is that when these cars detect a dynamic collision they toggle the direction of their motors and then when they detect another collision they toggle the direction again. Now it's not very sophisticated but it'll serve as an introduction into how collisions can affect the cars. Okay, let's have a look what's going on underneath the hood. Well, as you can see, I've made this uh, elliptical bumper, and this is the same dimensions as the shell thing, so that the collisions will be realistic. And this bumper is the thing that detects the dynamic collisions. Now, I've had to modify the, the, uh, the setup of the car somewhat. Let's just look at this from a side view. You see, with the original setup of the car, where it had wheel suspension and the, the car could bounce up and down on its wheels, if the car was to get a collision from the, from the say, the left-hand side, it would cause the bodywork to tilt on the springs, and there's always a chance that the body could touch the floor and, and uh, generate a false collision, false collision detection, I should say. So to prevent that, what I've done is I've realigned the wheels so that the, the wheels and the body and the suspension are all in one plane. And I've locked down the wheel suspension so that they don't have any movement in the Y direction. And that prevents uh, the bodywork accidentally touching the floor. OK, let's get started. OK, so we're back in the original scene. I'm going to delete these three cars and put the remaining car at the wheel zero using my PSR button. OK, now this is my little spotted shell that's going to go on this car. So I'm going to copy and paste it into the car scene. Now there's a bit of a mismatch of sizes here. And I think last time I did this I just shrunk the car down by 50%. So here we go. Hold down shift. 70, 60, 50. Yep, that should do. I can hide the hemisphere now. OK, now um, what I want to do now is to get the wheels and the suspension and get everything lined up on the same plane as the car body. So I better turn on snapping. OK, and I can grab the wheels, move the wheels up to zero. And the same for the suspension. And the same, just make sure the motors are lined up. OK, and I'm also going to have to um, lock down the wheel suspension so that the wheels can't move in the, in, the, uh, in the Y direction. So I can grab these wheel suspensions. And the way you, uh, you lock down the suspension is you just go to the upper and lower Y limit and just make them zero so that the, uh, the wheels can't move basically up and down. <laughs> OK, now this car body looks a bit too large compared to the wheels now that it's all lined up in one plane. So I'm just going to drop the uh, the Y size of the car body down to, say, 15. Yep, that should do it. OK, now we need to make a bumper. The bumper's got to be the same dimensions as the, uh, as the hemisphere shell thing. So let's look at this from the top down. And I'm going to make this bumper using a sweep nerb, so I'm going to need a spline to sweep the nerb around. I'm going to need a profile as well. So for the, uh, for the shape of this thing, we're going to need a circle. I can shrink this down. This is going to be an ellipse, actually, not a circle. So we we'll just check the ellipse box. And let's go for some nice round numbers. 80, 110. Yep, that should do it. And because the, the car is at uh, will zero, everything's going to be lined up on the correct plane, so you don't have to worry about uh, stuff being out of alignment. OK, now we need our sweep nerb. And um, for the profile on the rectangle. Now the body was 15 high, so I'm going to make the, uh, the bumper 15 high as well. And for the width, uh, no, 5 should do. In fact, I'll rename that profile. OK, the profile and the circle go into the sweep nerve. They've got to be in this order. If you do it in the other order, if you do it with circle first, you'll get the uh, get some strange results. <laughs> OK, I can rename this sweep nerve Bumper. And I can drop him into the hierarchy. 
Okay, now this bumper's going to be dynamic, so it needs a rigid body tag adding to it. Now I've got this up here in my little interface. So I've got the bumper highlighted, and I can click rigid body. Okay, now it might be a rigid body, but it's still not connected to the car, so we're going to need a connector. And yet again, from my little interface up here, connector. And this is going to be a fixed connector. I'll just change the type from hinge to fixed. And I can drop him into the hierarchy as well. And for the fixed connector, object A is going to be the car body. And object B is going to be the bumper. Let's just check. I think I've remembered everything. OK, so we'll drop the car to the floor now. And let's see what happens when we press play. Oh, man, look at that. <laughs> Well, what's going on here is that when I made the bumper a rigid body, I just left the shape at the default shape, which is automatic. And when, the, when it says automatic, that means it treats the whole object as one great big solid object. And what we've got here, we've got some uh, dynamic wheels inside of a dynamic body, and it just don't work sometimes. So you've got to change the shape from automatic to moving mesh. We might even have to change the, all the other items to move in mesh, but we'll see how this plays first of all. Oh yeah, hey, that's alright. <laughs> okay, so we've got our little car and the bumper. All we've got to do now is do the espresso. Well, I suppose I'd better drop the car bodywork into the hierarchy before we go any further. So let's grab the hemisphere and drop him in here and hide the dynamic car. Uh, so look at it from the side. Get this bodywork lined up correctly. Yeah, that should do, I think. Okay, let's see him in action. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. Okay, now for some espresso. Okay, let's get back to our dynamic car. Okay, what we need to do now is detect dynamic collisions on this bumper. So, we're going to drag the bumper into the Expresso window. OK, we need an output of objects from the bumper. And this is going to connect to a dynamic collision node. Now, this node has got two inputs, but if you just connect one object, it will detect collisions of the bumper with anything. OK, now the outputs on here is, is called count. And I always um, set this setting over here. One collision per pair. It's supposed to prevent getting like spurious outputs if you get like double bounces on an object. But I don't think this always works. So uh, just to make sure, I'm going to put a compare greater than zero after this count. Just to make sure that we're definitely dealing with, uh, with zeros and ones. OK, compare. That compare is going to be greater than zero. I better rename it. Greater than zero. OK. Now let's hang a result on here and just make sure that this is actually detecting collisions with our bumper. So we want general result. Now at the moment the car hasn't got anything to collide with, so I'm just going to put a, bump, um, a cube in here for it to bump into. So, make it nice and big so we can't miss it. I'm going to make this cube a collider object. So let's look at this from the, uh, from the top down. OK, there's our cube. So I'm just going to go through this one frame at a time, and when it collides with the cube, this should, the result should go from 0 to 1. Here we go, we're coming up to the cube. Any minute now. Yep, it's registered a collision. OK, so that part of it's working. So we'll just get rid of this uh, cube now. OK, well what I want this um, this result here, this uh, the output from this little setup, I want this to somehow toggle the speed of the motors. from. So, for instance, if the motors have a, a speed of, uh, say, plus 10, when I get a collision, I want that to switch to minus 10. Then when another collision comes along, I want it to switch back to plus 10 again. So the way I'm going to achieve that is like this. So let's just move this uh, steering stuff out of the way. We're not don't need any steering just at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to um, 
break into this little chain here when it goes speed to angular target speed I need to put some maths in here so I want um, let me think now a math multiply because I want to multiply the speed by either plus or minus one so I can put this math multiply in here hook it up so okay now for our plus and minus one I'm going to use a condition node I'm going to set this to uh, plus one and minus one okay so when I get um, a zero going in, into this condition node the car is going to be going forwards and when I put a one into this condition node the car is going to go into reverse but what I need now is I need some kind of interface between this part of the espresso and this part of the espresso basically what I need to happen is when I get a a pulse coming out of this um, output here I want that to set a value to say one then when the next pulse comes along I want to set a value back down to zero and the way you do that is using something called a flip-flop okay I got a little demo here about how a flip-flop works in Expresso now a flip-flop is basically a latching device whose output can either be zero or one and in this demo I'm representing zero by dark green and one by bright green now the way a flip-flop works is that when you trigger the device with an input pulse, the output toggles. Now what I mean by toggle is that it switches its state to its opposite. So that if currently this flip-flop has got an output of zero and we trigger it with an input pulse, the output will toggle to one. And because it's a latching device, it will stay on one indefinitely until we re-trigger the flip-flop. And then when we trigger the flip-flop again, the output will toggle, this time from the 1 down to a 0. And because it's a latching device, it will then stay on 0 indefinitely until the flip-flop is triggered again, when it will then toggle from 0 up to 1. So that's how the flip-flop works. When, it, when this device is triggered by an input pulse, the output toggles to its opposite state. Okay, so far so good. Now there's only one type of input which will trigger this flip-flop and that is when the input is going from a 0 to a 1. If the input goes from a 1 to a 0, nothing happens. So it's only triggered on what uh, electronics dudes would call the rising edge of a square wave. <laughs> so that when the input goes from 0 to 1, the output toggles. Okay, and I'm going to set this thing rolling now, and I'm going to say 0 to 1. Just keep your eye on the left-hand side for now. When I say 0 to 1, you'll see what I mean by rising edge. 0 to 1. 0 to 1. 0 to 1. 0 to 1. Okay, now that was when the input was going from low to high, from 0 to 1. So when I say 0 to 1, keep your eye now on the right-hand side, and you'll see that the output toggles. Okay, 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1 toggled, 0 to 1 toggled, 0 to 1 toggled. <laughs> so that's how it works basically, a 0 to a 1 switches the output. Now this is exactly what we need for our dynamic car bumper collision malarkey, because when we detect a collision with our bumper uh, software thing that we've just been looking at, when we detect a collision, we get, say, a pulse that goes from a 0 to a 1, if you remember. So that would then switch the direction of the motors to the opposite. So, for instance, if the, if the uh, random car was going in a forwards direction, then we get a pulse from a collision. It will switch the motors into the reverse direction. And because this is a latching device, it will then stay on reverse until we get another collision, then it will switch back to forward. Then we get another collision and it will switch back to reverse. And that is basically why we're going to use this flip-flop in our little bit of espresso. OK, well, let's get a flip-flop in our espresso now. So I'm going to right-click, General, Flip-flop. OK, and we connect the output to the switch input and the output the flip-flop to our condition node. 
Okay, now just like before, I think I'll put a couple of uh, collider cubes in this scene just to see if the motor's reversed correctly. So I'm going to go cube and make him nice and big so the the car can't miss it. <laughs> going to make that a collider. And um, I think I'll copy this. Yeah, let's have two cubes in the scene. Okay, let's press play and see what happens. Come on, hit something. Doink, reverse. Yep. <laughs> Doink, reverse. <laughs> Doink, reverse. Hey, it doesn't take much to amuse me. <laughs> okay, so let's get rid of these cubes and uh, get this car copied up. Duplicated, I should say. Right. Control, click. Uh, move them across. Control, click. Move them across. Control, click. Move them across. How many cars we're going to have? Let's have eight cars. Let's go crazy. Okay, move these across. Right now, I've got to rename all these cars with my amazing auto rename plugin. New name, uh, dynamic car. Add leading zeros. Rename. Okay, the moment of truth. Here we go. <laughs> and I think you'd say that was working. You know what? I think I'll just make those um, spotty shell things visible. So well, all we've got to do now is hide all these cars. Hide all the cars. And what did I call them? I think it was, they were called hemispheres, those bodies. Hemisphere, yep. So I'll make all these visible. Fantastic. And here we go. <laughs> yeah, but I think you could say that was the result. Okay, well that's the first part of my uh, collision theory and random cars business. I think the next thing to do is to do uh, some slightly more sophisticated collisions. Some slightly better software, I should say. Okay, that's it for now. Okay, here's the random car scene that we've just made. And although the collision detection that we've built into the Expresso, it does kind of work to a certain degree, and that it more or less stops the cars from getting jammed up, it could still be improved on, in my opinion. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's take this car here. Now well, let's say this car number 8 and the car in front were both travelling in the same direction. But this car somehow would just give it a little nudge from behind. Now in this situation, no avoiding action needs to be taken. But what would happen here in our present setup is that this will be detected as a collision and both cars would reverse the direction of their motors, which would probably result in another unnecessary collision. I mean, in a similar fashion, if this car comes alongside this another car and just nudges him slightly on the side, again, no avoiding action needs to be taken, but this will be detected as a collision, and both cars would reverse their direction. So you can easily end up with cars kind of oscillating if you're not careful. Okay, now here's how, how I propose to sort of like improve on this collision detection. Oh, where's my other scene? Here we go. Right, what I've done here, now let's just look at this from the top down. What I've done here is I've uh, chopped the bodywork so that I've got a front bumper and a rear bumper. Now the front bumper in, the, in this proposed setup will only be active when the car is going in the forwards direction. Now, if the car is going in reverse, the front bumper won't detect any collisions. In a similar fashion, if the car is going in reverse, the bumper at the back will detect the collisions, but the, the other bumper won't. And the bumpers on the side, or the side panels, whatever you like to call them, they're just things to bang into. These don't take any part in the collisions. So in this scenario, this would really improve uh, the performance and the behaviour of our cars. But there's one little drawback with this, and it's quite an interesting little problem, actually. I know how to solve this, but I'll tell you what the problem is. What you've got here is that the uh, the direction of the motors is going to select which bumper is active. So the, the motors are controlling the bumpers. But then when the bumper gets collided with, it will affect the direction of the motors. So you've got the motors controlling the bumpers and the bumpers controlling the motors. 
Now that is what you might call a loop in, in the terms of programming. Now Expresso doesn't allow you to have loops in the Expresso. You can't, you, what you can't do in Expresso is have a whole chain of nodes then get the outputs and connect it back to the input again. You just can't do that in Expresso. But I know a little trick where you can break that rule where you can connect an output to an input. So I'll show you how to solve this little problem. And it, the, you know the solution to this problem of uh, of having a loop in Expresso, it, it does crop up in other scenarios. So it's an usual little trick to learn. OK, let's get started. OK, well I can delete most of these cars and put the remaining car at the wheel centre. Now I think I'll drag the bumper out of this hierarchy. In fact, I'll drag the circle out of the bumper hierarchy. OK, let's look at this from the top down. Now if I'm going to be cutting through this circle, I'm going to have to make it editable. Then go into point mode, and I'm going to use the knife tool. So let's just double check that my snapping's on. Yep. OK, so I think I'll cut this one, two, three units down. Hold down shift to keep it level. And then, yep, that should do. For the front bumper, now the rear bumper, one, two, three units down. And, uh, yep, that looks good. Okay, now I'm going to make this uh, circle, I'm going to uncheck the closed spline. And I'm going to get my rectangle tool and select this point to make it the first point. Set first point. Okay, now I can select the part of the spline that's going to be the front bumper. And go split. Delete what's selected in the viewport. And the part that's been split off, I can rename that front bumper. OK. Back to my circle. I can grab this side. Split. Delete the part that's selected. Go into here and rename this left side. OK, back to my circle. I can split off the uh, the rear bumper now. Right click, split, delete the part that's selected, rename this part rear bumper. OK, and what's left should be the right hand side. So I can select what's left and the left side. Then right click them and go connect and delete. And these are going to be the sides. OK, so I've still got my bumper nerve there. So I'll drop the sides into that bumper and rename this sides. OK, now I want a, a duplicate of this. This is going to be front bumper. And I can uh, remove that side, and I want the front bumper in its place. OK. And I can duplicate this and make that rear bumper. Oops, can't spell. OK, and I can delete what's in there and put my rear bumper spline in. OK, let's have a look. Yeah, that's looking OK. So I can drop these uh, three bumpers back into the hierarchy. But they'll all need their own uh, fixed connector. So what's this fixed one joined to at the moment? He's joined to the sides, that's OK. So the sides are, are connected to the main body. So I can duplicate this fixed twice. And the first one is going to join the body to the uh, front bumper and the second fixed connector is going to join the body to the rear bumper. OK, so let's um, drop this car back to the floor again and see if it still works now we've chopped around with the uh, bodywork. Yep, haven't broken anything.
Okay, well that's the bumper sort now. Now we just need to tweak the espresso. Okay, well if you remember in the original Espresso, we just had this one item plugged into the Dynamics Collision node and this was because we were detecting collisions on a bumper that went completely around the vehicle. Now in this new setup we're going to be having front and rear bumpers and we're going to be switching between them so I can just delete this one here and drag in front bumper and rear bumper. Okay, now I want outputs, I want objects and the same for this one, objects. Now I'm going to be switching between these two bumpers, so I'm going to be using a condition node. Now this condition node, by default, it comes in with a data type real, and I want this to be data type object. OK, now I can connect these up. And I can connect the outputs to this dynamic collision node. So what this means now is that if I, if I put a zero on this switch port, it means that the front bumper will be plugged into Dynamics Collision and the front bumper will be doing the dynamic detection, the collision detection. And also if I put a one into this switched port, the rear bumper will be connected and so the rear bumper will be the one that's doing the uh, dynamic collision detection. OK, so it's 0 for forwards and 1 for reverse. Now if you remember the other end of our Espresso setup, where we had the flip-flop control in the direction of the motors, a 0 coming out of this flip-flop meant that the car was going forwards, and a 1 coming out of the flip-flop meant the car was going in reverse. Now hey, that's just what we need at the input side here. So why can't we just connect this output of the flip-flop and plug him straight into the uh, condition node? Now obviously it doesn't go green because we're not allowed to do this. In Expresso you cannot connect an output to an input, it just don't allow you to do it. Because I suppose in the uh, in the hands of the uninitiated you'd end up with your program oscillating or what, the, what people call race conditions. You just can't connect outputs to inputs. But I know a little trick to get around this and here's how you do it. OK, so I make a null and I'm going to rename this null proxy. OK, and I can drag that into the uh, hierarchy. And with proxy highlighted, I'm going to go user data, manage user data, add data, and I'm going to call this data 0 equals forward. And it's going to be data type boolean because it's just 0 equals forward, 1 equals reverse. It doesn't have to be animatable. OK, that's that bit done. And here's how we use the proxy. You just drag the proxy into the Espresso window. Now for an input, I want the user data we've just created, 0 equals forwards. Now what that means is that this flip-flop is now going to write data to this variable called proxy. Now we just drag the proxy in again, and this time we need an output of user data, 0 equals forwards. Now we can get the data that we've just written to this proxy, we can get it from the output ports. And for some reason, this allows you to uh, break that rule about no looping. So we write, write to the proxy, and then we read the data back. Now I think the reason this works is, uh, I don't know, this is just my theory. I reckon that when you write into this proxy out here, it takes one frame for the data to propagate through the node. That's just my theory. I, I could be wrong on that one. But either way, this allows you to connect an output to an input. So let's see if that works in real life. OK, so I've got to multiply this car up, duplicate it a few times, that is. And another one. And another one. OK, now I might as well make 8, just like the other example. OK, now don't forget to rename your cars, because it, it, all this business of uh, the, the automatic seed, it don't work unless you rename them correctly. So I'm going to call these guys proxy cars. Sounds like a taxi firm. Hello, proxy cars, can I help you? <laughs> OK, so um, two chances, as I always say, two chances here, yes or no, it'll either work or it won't. Now, if this works, what you'll see is that when a car gets a collision on any of the three surfaces, except the one that's in the direction of travel, 
collision on any of the other three surfaces will not result in a change of, of motor direction, but a collision on the bumper in the direction of travel will make the car reverse. So let's see what it looks like. In fact, let's look at this from the top down and see if we can uh, find some uh, interesting collisions so we can test our little theory. Uh, okay, now these two look interesting. Well, to me anyway. <laughs> this car to the left looks like it's about to hit this guy on the side. Now, if this is going to happen like it, appears to be. The car that's being hit on the side will not change its direction of travel, but this guy, because he's colliding with the uh, the forward-facing bumper, should toggle his direction. So let's do this one frame at a time. There's a collision. And he carries on his merry way, and this guy goes in the opposite direction. So hey, QED as they say, I've proved my point. So I think that's just about working. <laughs> I know, let's look at these uh, guys with the uh, the nice spotty shells in view. So I'll just hide all these cars. Let's find my hemispheres. Make them visible. Okay, let's see these uh, random proxy cars in their full glory. <laughs> Okay, well, I think uh, I think you could say this was working. By the way, if you get a bit adventurous and decide to crank up the speed and the torque of these cars, you may find that they tip a little bit when they collide. Now, if that happens, all you've got to do is go Control d to go to your project settings. And under Dynamics, on the General tab, you just go to the gravity and, and change it from, say, 1,000 is, is the standard one. Maybe double it or make it 5,000. Now, that will make the cars heavier, but it won't give them any more mass. So you don't need to change, like, the torque or anything to make the cars move at the same speed. That just affects the weight. A lot of people don't understand the difference between mass and weight. But I can assure you, if you increase the gravity, the cars don't go slower. They just get heavier, so they don't tip when they collide. But that's what you need to do if they tip a little bit. But for now, I think that's uh, the end of this part of the uh, little collision dynamic random car nonsense. So I think I will go and get a well-deserved cup of tea. Okay, well the final bit of random car collision theory I'll be showing you today is a bit more interesting than the other two in my opinion. And it's the one I use for these computer mouses where they detect a collision on their front surface and then kick into reverse for about half a second to get themselves out of a jam. And all that's going on here, I'll just show you underneath the, uh, underneath the hood. These guys have just got one bumper at the front that detects the uh, the dynamic collisions and the bumper that goes all the way around the body is just there for the other cars to bounce off. Now to save a bit of time, I've already prepared uh, some bumpers to go around this mouse because I'm sure you don't want to sit there and watch me chase around an object with a Bezier spline tool. But all, all that's going on here is, uh, like I said, I just traced around the mouse with the with the Bezier tool, made a spline, and then I just chopped through it to make the front bumper. Okay, let's get started. Okay, well, I'm going to reuse the dynamic car and some of the Espresso code from the first scene that we did. I'm talking about this one here with the uh, the solid bumper that goes all the way around the vehicle. All right, so I'm going to delete most of these cars and put the remaining one at the wheel sensor. And let's see, we can get rid of the bumpers, because we're going to have new bumpers. And get rid of that spotted hemisphere thing. Don't need that anymore. OK, let's go and get the mouse and the new bumpers. Here we go. Copy. Paste that into the other scene. And I'm going to put the mouse and the bumpers in the uh, hierarchy of the car. I think I'll hide the mouse for now because we don't really need to be seeing the mouse. OK, well, uh, there's still one fixed connector from the original scene. I'm going to need two connectors for these two bumpers. So I'll copy that fixed connector. And the first one is going to join the car to the front bumper. And the second fixed connector is going to join the car to the uh, main bumper. OK, now these two bumpers, they need to be made rigid bodies. 
Now, if you remember last time when uh, we made the bumper a rigid body and set it rolling, and the whole thing exploded. <laughs> Well, that was because I didn't set the uh, the tags to uh, moving mesh. So I'm going to change the tags of these two bumpers from automatic to moving mesh. Now, I may have to change the uh, some of these wheels and bodywork to moving mesh in a minute. We'll just see how it goes, first of all. But let's have a look at this from the top-down view because uh, the wheels are kind of intersecting with the, uh, the outer bumper somewhat. So I'm going to drag the wheels inwards, inside of the, uh, the main body a bit and we'll see how that runs so I think I'll use the uh, the snapping tool here and I'm going to snap to the uh, to the actual edge of the uh, of this yellow cube so I, want, I don't need vertex snap I want edge snap let's just leave this visible so I can see what's going on don't need work plane edge snap that's the one okay so I'm going to grab the front left wheel and the front left suspension and hopefully these will just snap to this car body yep okay and uh, front right snap okay and the rear left and the rear right now you're probably thinking at this point, hold on, these wheels are intersecting with the uh, the dynamic body of the car. I mean, surely this is going to give us problems. Well, sometimes it gives you problems and sometimes it doesn't. I usually just uh, see what happens. And if if, the, if you do get a problem, I set everything to move in mesh. That's my kind of uh, basic principle with this uh, dynamic stuff going wrong. <laughs> Okay, now before we can actually test this, I'm going to have to go into the Expresso and tweak a few things because uh, if you have stuff in the Expresso that isn't connected to anything anymore or there's something gone wrong, like you've imported code from another scene or whatever, it all shows up yellow like this. And when you've got anything yellow in your scene or anything that just says um, like a, a general word like object, <laughs> What this basically means is that nothing in this Expresso window is going to work at all. If all you need is one bit of yellow and nothing will work at all. So if I set this running now, the motors probably won't even turn. You know what I mean? Okay, so I can get rid of this uh, first bumper that doesn't exist anymore. And I don't think we need this flip-flop anymore. Because I'll be using something else. Okay, right, there's no yellow showing, so uh, hopefully we can test this car now and see if it uh, needs any more tweaking before we start putting the code together. So I'll drop the car to the uh, floor. Now let's hit play and see how it rolls. Ah, well, I didn't need to set anything else to move in mesh. It all seems to play nicely. Well, what a surprise number of times I've made cars and I think everything's going to work and it just explodes all over the place. <laughs> okay, so I think we can say that that car's good to go. So now for the next stage. Okay, well the first thing we've got to do is hook this front bumper up in Expresso so that it's actually detecting dynamic collisions. So we'll drag our Expresso window back and I'll drag the front bumper into the Expresso window and I want an object output. And uh, we can just hook him up to uh, input A. Okay, well that's the uh, the dynamic collisions of the front bumper sorted out. Now if you remember this uh, this other bit of the Expresso from the first scene, all that was going on was that this condition node had a plus one and a minus one t so that the motors would go forwards or reverse. So what we need to do now is to have some kind of interface between the dynamic collisions and the motor control. And what the interface has got to do is that when a collision is detected, we need to flip this over from forwards to reverse for about half a second and then flip it back. Now, the thing that uh, you use in Expresso to do those kind of jobs is something called a monoflop. OK, I've got a little demo here to show you how a monoflop works. Now, a monoflop has got two modes. One mode is called normal, and the second mode is called one-shot. We'll be using the one-shot mode today. And the way that works is that when the monoflop gets a pulse on the trigger input, the output goes high for a length of time specified by the duration.
So I'll just set this rolling and see what happens. Now I'm going to be putting a pulse on the left hand side, which is, uh, I think it's about every couple of seconds, there's a, a very quick pulse will, will come along on the inputs, and the output will go on and stay on for a length of time specified by the duration, which at the moment I've got it set to 0.8 of a second. Anyway, let's just set him rolling and see what, how it works. So it goes, pulse stays on, pulse stays on, pulse stays on. OK, so when if you get a pulse, the output stays on for a length of time specified on the uh, duration input port. Now, I've, I've got it set at 0.8 of a second at the moment. If I crank up the, uh, the duration to, say, I don't know, 1.4. OK, when this pulse comes along, you'll see that the output stays on for a lot longer. See, it stays on for the duration. So let's just set this duration to something quite low, say 0.3. Now when the input pulse comes along, the output will only be on for a fairly short period of time. OK, and that is basically how a monoflop works. So we're going to have the, our monoflop set to about, I don't know, 0.7 of a second. So what this is going to do is that when a collision is detected by the front bumper, that's going to give us a trigger for the input of the monoflop. So the collision gives us a trigger, a trigger pulse I should say, and then the output will go high, which means that the uh, the motors are in reverse and it'll, the motors will be in reverse for a period of time specified by the duration. And at the moment we've got that set to 0 0.7 of a second. So it'll look a bit like this. So, so it was... Reverse, back to normal. Reverse, back to normal. Reverse, back to normal. So that's how the monoflop is going to work in our setup. OK, let's get ourselves a monoflop. So right click, general monoflop. Now because this fella is a timer, we need to connect a time node to the time input port. So we've got right click, time and plug him into the time port. OK, so the dynamic collision is going to be connecting to the trigger of the monoflop and uh, the output is going to be uh, connecting to the uh, switch of the condition node. And this monoflop needs to be set to not normal, but one shot. OK, now also we need to set the duration of this monoflop. Now, out here in the uh, in the interface, you set it in frames, but in the Expresso window, we uh, you got to use seconds. Now, because I'll be using a slider on my control panel, the slider is going to have to be set in seconds. OK, so let's make a slider. User data. Manage user data. Add data. We're going to call this... Uh, Reverse seconds. OK. Slider interface. Real number. I think uh, two seconds will do for the maximum for this slider. Uh, for the uh, step, I think um, 0.1. Yep, that should do. OK. So now we just need to drag our control into the window. And we need an output of, uh, what are we, reverse seconds. OK, now all we've got to do is test this fella. So I think I'll put two big cubes in, like I normally do with these things. <laughs> two giant cubes for our little car to, uh, to collide into. OK, so we can make him a collider. And I think I'll just duplicate this. OK, let's hit play and see what happens. Yep, when he collides, he goes into reverse. Uh, let's just um, set that a little bit longer. Where's my control panel? 0.5. Let's make it, say, 0.8. See if that gives us a bit more... Uh, sensible movement. One thing you've got to remember when you've got a, when you're switching a car into reverse like this is that sometimes you've got to increase the torque because the torque is what kind of moves the car from forwards to reverse. And if you haven't got enough torque, well, it, it just uh, seems to go a bit slow. So uh, let's just set this value down a bit to say to 0.7 and increase the torque. Let's see what that looks like. Oh yeah, the reverse is back a lot quicker now. 
Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I think we can say that uh, this part of the experiment is a success. Okay, well let's delete these two giant cubes. And um, I think it's time to test this follow But first of all, I just want to see what the uh, alignment of the mouse is looking like. So let's look at this from the side. Yeah, I think that's just about okay for the, uh, the height of the mouse. Height off the ground, that is. Okay, so uh, I think it's time to uh, copy this fella and have him bang it into some of his colleagues. So we want to uh, copy, move across, copy, move across, copy, move across, and uh, get another four of those. Stick them over here. And don't forget to rename your cars. I think I'll just call these guys car today. <laughs> okay, and uh, leading zeros as usual. Rename. Yep, that's looking good. Okay, let's hit play and see what happens. You know what? I think this is working. <laughs> Yeah, and when, they, when they're having collisions in the in a forwards direction on their front surface, they are uh, kicking into reverse for a short period of time. OK, well, let's get these mouses on view now and see what it looks like in, in the real world. So we'll hide all these dynamic cars and find my mouses. Yep. OK, come on, mouses, do your stuff. <laughs> oh man, it's all working just like I planned. Okay, well I think that's just about the end of our uh, little adventure into dynamic random cars and collision theory and all that stuff. I know I've gone on a bit longer than I wanted to, but uh, I hope you've learned a bit of something today. And I hope, or maybe you just had a bit of fun watching all my crazy mouses doing their thing. Okay, well that's it for now I think. I'll see you next time.